All right, so welcome everybody. I'm really glad that you're all here with us today. My name is Elizabeth McMunn Tatenko, and I'm a librarian here at UC Merced. And I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Sidra Goldman Miller, who is going to be giving our library faculty author series talk today. The faculty author series showcases the latest research and scholarship by UC Merced faculty members. And this is our first all online talk, which is really exciting. Um, if you're watching this and would like to be featured in a future faculty author series talk, please let me know. Um, as for today, we're thrilled to have Dr. Goldman Miller be part of this series. Dr. Goldman Miller is an associate professor of public health here at UC Merced. She received her MPH in social and behavioral health and her PhD in epidemiology from the UC Berkeley School of Public Health and also completed an NIH funded postdoctoral fellowship at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. Her work focuses on connections between the social environment and risk for psychological problems like depression, anxiety and suicidal behavior, in addition to how these problems affect risk for other kinds of poor health outcomes. And we're so happy to have her with us today. And I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you, Elizabeth. What a nice introduction. Uh, well, thank, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, just as a forewarning, I have like ongoing vocal problems. So my voice is like a little bit scratchy, but hopefully that will not affect the, the presentation at all. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. Do you have slides? So um, yeah, as Elizabeth said, so I'm, I'm a psychiatric epidemiologist. All my work um, focuses oops, um, on suicidal behavior um, and depression and other mental health problems. Um, a lot of the work that I do these days is sort of more clinical epidemiology because sort it's of focused on like healthcare data. Um, so that's what I will be talking about um, today. Um, so it, it's sort of using big data um, to, to understand in a kind of a different way, um, drug and suicide deaths that focuses on California. Um, and I, um, the kind of goal of this work is to um, help, uh, you know, um, kind of figure out who are the, the folks who are most at risk of um, drug and suicide deaths. Um, how can we intervene on them? How can you know we use these big data um, in part to inform policy um, solutions? So um, for those of you who are, don't follow kind of the latest um, news with respect to, to suicide rates, um, they have been going up um, for quite a while now. Um, over the last 20 years, roughly, um, there's been, it's actually now more than a 33% increase because these are, these data are a couple of years old um, and the suicide rate has continued to go up. So this is showing data of the suicide rate per 100,000 um, people um, between 1999 and 2017. And like in 2018 and 19, um, it actually just like continued to go up. Um, so kind of one thing to notice here is that so there's been a 33% increase overall in the suicide rate. Um, so these are deaths by suicide, um, but there's a huge gender difference here, right? So males, uh, men have much higher suicide rates than women do. Um, but like the increase that, that we see here has actually been even sort of greater in, in women than it has in men. But basically like every demographic group that you look at, the suicide rate has been going up over the past 20 years. Um, and probably you're sort of more familiar with the fact that drug overdose death rates have also been going up and like by a huge amount. Um, so this is the same time period. Again, these are deaths per 100,000 um, people in the United States. And over that time period, there has been a 255% increase um, in the drug death rate um, in the United States. Um, and again, there's the, you see this kind of male female disparity where males are at much higher risk um, than females are. So this is like, so drug deaths that I'm showing here that encompasses like accidental drug deaths, right? Where somebody sort of accidentally overdoses. It actually also includes suicide drug deaths. So this graph and the previous graph are like slightly overlapping because there are some um, suicide deaths, of course, like, you know, the, um, the person died um, uh, by suicide using, using drugs. Um, so they're slightly overlapping, but like the, the vast majority of the drug deaths that you see here are accidental 
um, drug overdoses. Um, so these big increases have contributed to um, suicide and drug deaths um, kind of emerging as, as leading causes of death um, in the United States. So this graph, there's like, there's like a lot going on here, um, but um, what this is showing is the 10 leading causes of death. Um, this is as of 2018, um, and this is for like everybody, but it's broken down by age group. Okay, so like there you see, you know, under one year olds, um, and then you know, every other age group kind of in, in five to 10 year um, brackets. So, oops. So the kind of the, maybe the most important thing to focus on here is like this last column, this is everybody together. Um, so among, if you look at like the entire US population um, in all age groups, um, so suicide um, is the 10th leading cause of death overall, and unintentional injuries um, are the third leading cause of death. And so in kind of previous years, a lot of those would have been um, like car accidents. Uh, and still, you know, there's, you know, there are thousands and thousands of car accidents every year. But now, like, actually, the majority of those unintentional injuries are drug overdoses. Um, so they, they really, like, these two causes of death are, you know, kind of major contributors to the burden of mortality in the U.S. So that's the U.S. What do things look like in California? Um, so California, we're different in many respects, right? Uh, we, are, we are unique in many ways. Um, in, in California, actually, we have sort of lower than average suicide rates. Um, and up until recently, we also had lower than average drug overdose rates, although that is changing a bit now. So these are some showing, this graph is showing kind of, you know, similar, um, similar time frame, but this is data for California. So in California, the suicide rate is a little bit lower than average. So here it's kind of hovering at down around 10 deaths per 100,000, uh, whereas overall in the United States is about an average of about 14 per 100,000. Um, but it has gone up 13% uh, um, over the last, you know, 20 years. Um, same with drug death rate. So the, the rates here are a little bit um, higher rate. So I'm showing the suicide rate again in orange. Drug death rates um, kind of started out below those of suicide, but have gone steadily upwards. And as of 2018, were you know quite a bit higher than the suicide rates. Um, and so drug deaths in this time period have increased about 48%. So this is both like good news and bad news for California. Good news being that we have lower than average drug overdose and suicide death rates. Um, but the bad news is both rates are rising. And particularly for drug overdoses, actually in the last few years, like there's, you know, there's kind of more opioid, more fentanyl in California. There's also more, um, more methamphetamine use um, happening in California, which is, you know, not great in the long run. So, okay, so how do we think about these dual challenges? So you guys know I'm a, um, I'm a faculty member in public health. I have a public health background. And so like, I think of there's many ways to think about these challenges, but I tend to think about it from a public health sort of perspective. And in public health, kind of what we focus on are like different levels of prevention. So primary prevention is sort of like, it's the most basic sort of population-wide approach to preventing health problems. So for, for me, like in the work that I do, like this would translate to strategies that help the entire population avoid like development of suicidal distress and drug addiction, right? Like prevent them from ever sort of developing really severe psychological problems and suicidal distress and drug addiction in the first place, right? Um, so then there's what's called, um, so things, um, so like primary prevention and public health perspective, this would be like vaccines, right? So vaccines are primary prevention because it prevents, you know, everybody hopefully from, um, or almost everybody from just getting the disease in the first place. Um, secondary prevention, um, is, uh, more targeted at people who are, um, discovered or identified as being at higher risk. Um, so um, this is like, they're already demonstrating kind of signs and symptoms of the, you know, whatever the disease is. And now you wanna swoop in and like prevent it from getting worse, basically. So like, you know, um, yeah, I don't know. 
So like treating people or getting people into treatment like really early on before the problem gets worse. So for me, this would be like uncovering, you know, potentially, so people who are really distressed and who are maybe engaging in what's looking like problematic drug abuse or, you know, drug use. Um, so people who are vulnerable and getting them into treatment. Tertiary prevention is, this is really about like medical care, essentially. This is like treating people who um, have, you know, already, um, you know, dis developed the disorder or the disease in question, getting them into care and making sure that like, you know, sort of we can extend their quality of life, extend their span of life and prevent them from getting worse. Um, so for, for my field, this would be like treating people who are presenting to, you know, a hospital or to their doctor um, with suicidal behavior, or they've, you know, actually already overdosed, but it, they didn't die, fortunately. And like, we want to facilitate their entry into mental health treatment, drug abuse treatment um, to prevent further harm. So this is kind of where I focus a lot of my current research is on this, you know, secondary and tertiary prevention. And I do that by focusing on healthcare um, settings. So why healthcare settings? Um, well, healthcare settings actually are a fairly promising context for secondary and tertiary prevention with respect to like drug overdose and suicidal behavior. Um, there's a lot of research showing that people who die by suicide or who die of drug overdose, that the vast majority of them actually like had contact with the healthcare system in the year before their death. So they might not have been coming in because they were, you know, feeling distressed or suicidal or for drug abuse, like they could have come in because they broke their leg or, you know, like, you know, had the flu or whatever, but they're making contact with the healthcare system and like, if we can sort of identify them early at that point, you know, when they're coming into the healthcare system, then maybe we could, you know, flag them as high risk or vulnerable and hopefully, you know, get them into treatment and care in a way that would prevent their deaths um, in the long run. So um, this is kind of a stated goal in my field of research is like healthcare settings are like, okay, like, you know, we should be doing this more, we recognize that we should be doing this more, but we're actually still missing um, a lot of information on how to do this and who, who counts as vulnerable, who should we be focusing on, basically. And part of the reason for that is because we don't have good follow-up data on healthcare patients, right? So like, you come into the healthcare system, and then, you know, you sort of go on your way, and later, you, you know, you overdose on drugs or you attempt suicide or in fact die by suicide, the healthcare system generally like has no idea that you did that. We're not routinely tracking um, um, healthcare patients. So we don't, when I was began this research, like we didn't know how common death by suicide or drug overdose was among uh, healthcare patients. And we didn't know who was most at risk. And this is important um, because knowing kind of what to expect in, certain, in terms of mortality outcomes among these patients can help clinicians make the best treatment decisions. It can report, um, support risk stratification efforts, which means like identifying who the highest risk like healthcare patients are to so like to make sure that we get them into care. Um, and it can inform and hopefully over the long run generate demand for like better healthcare. Right, like quality improvement efforts that really, you know, um, prioritize um, targeting people for care because we know we recognize that they're vulnerable. So this kind of longitudinal tracking of mortality outcomes is actually like super routine in certain aspects of healthcare. If you ever get diagnosed with cancer, and I hope like none of us do, but but if you do, there's actually huge public health systems in place to track what happens to you, what treatment you get, you know, and sort of survival, you know, quality of care, et cetera. Totally routine in cancer, but it basically never happens for people with mental health and, um, and drug abuse, sort of behavioral health issues. Ooh, sorry, the text got all weird down there. So, Part of the reason for that is because suicide and drug mortality are relatively rare. So I think it just like has not been prioritized. And frankly, mental and behavioral health issues are still really stigmatized. 
So there, there's, there's a lot of complex reasons for this. But my solution to this issue has been um, leveraging big linked data. So I work a lot with data from the California Department of Health's this particular office, the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development, OSHPID as it's called. So what OSHPID does is they collect data, uh, sort of uh, certain data elements, like anytime you go to the emergency room or the hospital, that hospital that you went to has to report a few sort of key characteristics about your visit to this office. So any of you who have like been to the ED in the last you know, 20 years or the hospital, your data got like extracted along with everybody else's and like sent to this office in an anonymous way. Um, but it's not like they, they, they take your social security number, but and then when they make that data available to researchers, I can never see your social security number. So I don't know who anybody is, but the cool thing about this is that they retain like a unique identifier that what that allows me to do as a researcher, when I get the kind of research version of these data is identify a particular, like I can see for any sort of anonymized patient who came to the emergency room in a particular year, if they come back to any other emergency room or hospital in the state within three years, I can track that it's the same person over time. Like I can see, oh, like, you know, this young male, you know, broke his leg in 2019. And now here it is in 2021, he's come back because he's got the flu. So I can track people over time as they're coming, you know, to the hospital. And um, the state also facilitates linkage with the state death records. So I can also see whether um, that person um, died um, and what they died of, you know, over the next three years. Okay, so the basic approach to this is that um, I use epidemiologic methods to look at, you know, mortality rates among emergency department patients. Um, and then I compare those mortality rates to a demographically matched kind of version of the entire California population. And so what I can do is like compare the mortality experiences of emergency department patients, you know, who are coming in for like specific reasons um, to the mortality experiences of the entire California population. So I do about a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of work with these data. I'll just briefly go over a few projects today. So this is looking at mortality outcomes among emergency department or ED patients with suicidal behavior, um, mortality outcomes among patients, ED patients with drug overdose, and mortality outcomes among um, postpartum women, right? So women who have just had babies. So to give you kind of an illustration of what this looks like. So um, for this particular project, um, we looked at um, patients who had come into the ED because they had deliberately injured themselves, right? So basically they made a suicide attempt, but they fortunately didn't die, but they injured themselves badly enough that they had to come to the emergency department. So those are the self-harm injury patients. Then we looked at patients who came to the ED because they had suicidal ideation, which means they were having sort of like serious thoughts about suicide, but they hadn't acted on those thoughts, right? So they haven't hurt themselves. And then we took a 5% sample, random sample of all other patients in the emergency department. So they could have come in because like they had an asthma attack or they broke their leg or they had some other mental health problem or like whatever, they had cancer, like anything, just 5% random sample. All of these, these three different groups of patients, we tracked them forward for um, 12 months, right? 365 days to see what their rates of death were in the kind of subsequent 12 months. And we looked at sort of a, a few different outcomes. So just to kind of orient you to what this looks like. The other thing that we were doing again is like comparing their mortality experiences to the mortality experiences of the underlying California population, right? Like people who might never have gone to the emergency room. So it's the entire California population, but in, a, in such a way that like they matched demographically. So age, race, and sex. Um, so this matching California population, their suicide rate in kind of, uh, you know, the, the same year um, was 12.3 per 100,000. So that's like basically the state average, right, for the suicide rate. Um, 
that that random sample of emergency department patients, um, right, the ones who could come in for asthma or flu or whatever, their suicide rate in the subsequent 12 months was about two times higher um, than the underlying California population. So even though like, I mean, some of them are coming in from mental health problems, but you know, most of them are not. And like, even still, so it like, just kind of a random sample of emergency department patients, their suicide rate is two times higher than the underlying California population. But then, okay, so then like same, same data that I just showed you, but on a bigger scale here. So this is the matching California population, then these like the random sample of reference patients. Now, when we look at the suicide rate among those suicidal ideation patients, right, the ones who haven't hurt themselves, but how are having serious thoughts of suicide, what we see is that their suicide rate is 26 times higher compared to the matching California population. And when we look at the self-harm patients, what we see is that their suicide rate is 56 times higher. So it's almost 700 per 100,000, right? That's a suicide. So this is like, this is an astronomically high rate of suicide. It's really, really, really high. And like, you would sort of expect that, right? That like, I mean, these are people who have already basically attempted suicide. So like, you know, they are clearly experiencing, you know, extreme distress um, in their lives. Um, so, but, you know, it, it's, it's interesting that like, their rate is so much higher than the, than the suicidal ideation patients. So we also looked at mortality from other causes um, in, and I'll focus here on the, these particular two groups. So here are the suicide rates that I just showed you, right? So the suicide rates in the ideation patients, suicide rates in the self-harm patients, the, the black bars are the, the comparison California population. So then we looked at accidents, which so is like any kind of accident, right? Any kind of accidental injury that the person died of. So you can see that among the suicidal patients, like their accident rate, death, you know, death rates from accidents is even higher than their suicide rate. Um, they have a very low homicide rate. I mean, homicide rates in California are just low in general. But then they have like a, a much higher death rate from natural causes, right? From, from heart disease, cancer, any natural cause. Um, and you see kind of similar patterns among the self-harm patients, right? They also have um, high accident rates, um, higher than average homicide rates, and very high rates of death from natural causes. Um, and there were, like we kind of drilled down to see like, who is it, you know, at, at even more increased risk, particularly for suicide. So when we're looking at suicide, we, we found that among both the self-harm patients and the suicidal ideation patients, older men, white patients, um, privately insured patients, um, and those who had kind of a history um, of psychiatric diagnoses. I mean, these all kind of make sense. Like this is, this is really, this is really consistent with lots of other research um, that has shown this, but it's like, you know, even among emergency department patients, you see um, these same patterns, older men, white patients, um, privately insured, that was actually a little bit of a surprise. And then those with psychiatric diagnoses. So what, what this particular kind of work is showing is that the, those ED patients that are presenting with suicidal behavior, either thoughts or actual injuries are at really, really high risk for suicide. Um, but suicide isn't in fact the only cause of death that they're at high risk for. And to me, this is really interesting because, you know, when in the suicide prevention field, like what, what researchers and sort of what like the general, I don't know, all the people who work in this area, what we're really focused on is preventing suicide. And of course we need to prevent suicide, but like among this, you know, very distressed group of people, suicide isn't the only thing that we should be worrying about, right? Like we need to be paying attention to the fact um, that, you know, folks who are coming into the healthcare system with suicidal ideation and um, self-harm behavior are at really high risk of these other, you know, mortality outcomes also. Okay, so the next paper uh, or the next kind of project I'll talk about is I'm kind of doing a similar thing on patients with drug overdose. Um, so for this project, um, we're focusing on two, like basically the two most common 
um, classes of drugs um, that are you know, most commonly used in the United States, and that is opioids, which you're probably not surprised about. Um, and the other one is sedative, what it's the, the medical class um, of these drugs are called sedatives and hypnotics. So opioids um, include both prescription opioids, you know, like methadone, oxycodone, um, as well as illicit opioids like heroin. And the sedative and hypnotic drugs include, like this is a prescription drug category and it would include things like Ambien or anti-anxiety medications like Valium or Xanax. Um, so like this is basically taking the same data, right? Patients who are coming in between 2009 and 2011, but instead of focusing on the, those kind of suicidal patients, it's focusing on the, the accidental drug overdose patients. But again, we followed them forward for 12 months um, to look at their mortality experiences. And, to, to like provide a little bit of context for this. So there's a, a lot of research suggesting that, you know, people with drug abuse problems very, very frequently have mental health problems that underlie the drug abuse or sometimes complicate the drug abuse or make it worse. Or in fact, sometimes can be triggered by the, the drug abuse. So these are like very interlinked kinds of problems, um, but there was just not very much known about specifically like suicide mortality among people who, you know, who have overdosed on drugs. So we wanted to just learn more about that. Um, so among the opioids, so first we looked at suicide rates. So among the opioid um, patients, um, here we saw, again, really high suicide rates, like more than 300 deaths, suicide deaths per 100,000 um, people. Um, again, like 18 times higher than the underlying matched California population. Um, the sedative and hypnotic patients, um, their suicide rates weren't quite as high, but you know, still nine times higher um, than, the, than the comparison California population. Then we looked at their accidental drug overdose mortality rate. So this is like they overdosed on any drug by accident. Um, so here, what we see is that the opioid patients, their drug overdose mortality rate was more than a hundred fold higher than the California population. It's just like, it's just an astronomically high drug overdose death rate, um, you know, more than, it like, yeah, it's, it, you know, 18, more than 1800 out of 100,000 people. It's just, it's so high. Um, the set of hypnotic patients, these tend to be sort of older patients. The opioid patients are younger on average. They have a much lower rate of um, drug overdose mortality, but it's still, you know, 25, almost 25 times higher um, than the California population. Um, we also looked at mortality from other causes. And here again, we see the same pattern as compared with the, the suicidal patients where, um, so here's the overdose state, you know, that's again, which I just showed. So there, there's, um, and then the suicide rates. And then when we look at the natural causes, um, the opioid patients, they are dying of natural causes at eight times the rate um, of the underlying California population. Um, and same with the, sed the sedative or hypnotic overdose patients. Um, these folks, they're, they are, because they're older, like their death rate from natural causes um, is, it's like, yeah, it's almost 20%, like almost 20% of them died from natural causes in the year after their, their overdose. So again, just to summarize the, um, the, the, the opioid um, and the sed these sedative and hypnotic drug overdose patients, they come into the ED like in the year after that, you know, that, that presentation at the emergency department, they have again, just these like incredibly high rates of mortality that, you know, frankly, like most practitioners are just not really paying attention to. Um, their excess mortality is highest in sort of relative terms, right? Like relative to the California population, their excess mortality is the highest for drug overdose. Um, but like the majority of their deaths sort of in absolute terms are actually from natural causes. So it's like, well, which, you know, which one do you wanna focus on? If you wanna present, prevent more of their deaths, we actually need to be focusing on those natural causes. 
Um, so the last thing I'll focus um, talk about is mortality outcomes among postpartum women. This this paper came out um, a couple of years ago now, um, but it's sort of related to like ongoing work that I'm doing. Um, so this is a slightly different sort of area of epidemiology that's really focused on kind of perinatal epidemiology. So like, you know, in and around the time of birth um, for, for women. Um, and pregnancy associated deaths. So these are deaths that occur while the woman is pregnant or in the, in the year after the birth of her child. Um, and so if you may not be aware, but um, the US actually has like one of the highest, if not the highest rate of pregnancy associated death among the sort of the Western world. And it's our, our rate of maternal mortality has been going up in recent years. So this is sort of like, it is a national embarrassment basically. Um, and there's a lot of attention paid um, to this. So a lot of those, pregnancy associated deaths are due to obstetric um, reasons. Um, but so this, this, I did this work with a, a good friend and colleague of mine who's at Michigan State. And we were kind of looking through the literature and realizing like, we think actually that, that a lot of these moms are probably dying from drugs and suicide because we know that reproductive aged women you know, are at risk, high risk for death from drugs and suicide. But really like not very many people have been looking at this in among, you know, in pregnancy associated deaths. Um, so it just like hadn't received a lot of attention. But, you know, this is contextualized in the fact that like opioid use rates have been going um, uh, and suicide deaths sort of in general among reproductive age women have increased drastically um, over the last 10, 15 years. So we, we just wanted to delve more into this topic. So we decided to look at the incidence of drug related deaths and suicide um, among women who, you know, had delivered a child in California in 2010 through 2012, we wanted to look at sort of heterogeneity in their death rates by sort of basic sociodemographic factors. And then also to look at, like, among the women who died, could, like, can we see whether there are patterns of emergency department visits, like, between her, the delivery of her child and her death, where we could, you know, providers could maybe have like raised a red flag, but like this woman is a really high risk. Um, could, and to figure out like, can those healthcare encounters serve um, as a chance to identify women um, who are at risk? So the study design is basically the same. So we took all of the, um, all the women um, with, with a valid social security number basically, um, who delivered in the California hospital, um, between 2010 and 2012, so there's over a million of them. And then we tracked them for 12 months to see, you know, if they died and if so what they died of, and also their, their subsequent emergency department um, and hospitalization visits. So when we look at their mortality rates, um, what you can see here, so this is the mortality rate per 100,000. Um, their mortality rates in general are low, but again, it's like still higher than basically every other Western country. Obstetric causes of death for the women are the most common. So those were the leading cause of death um, among these California postpartum women. Um, but drug-related causes of death, um, which is mostly like accidental drug overdoses, it was the second leading cause of death um, among these women. Um, then there was sort of other causes of death, homicide falls in there, and then suicide um, was the... Um, Seventh, how does it six? But it's the seventh leading cause of death, and then all other causes are kind of lumped into one. Um, so you know, we we were right basically that like um, drug related and causes of death and suicide are really kind of prominent causes of mortality in these women. Um, there were subgroups um, of these women who are at higher risk. So actually, um, this is the um, this is the incidence rates for drug or suicide death, could we kind of lump them together for this analysis? Um, so white women are actually, non-Hispanic white women are at highest risk for drug or suicide death. Um, and then women who, who have Medicaid insurance um, or other, some other form of insurance, so not basically not private insurance. If you're 
So basically, like, if they're poor, they're at higher risk, which, you know, is not surprising, but at least now we have, like, a firm estimate on, like, how much more um, they are at risk. So then again, we looked at the, the um, like, hospital utilization um, among all of these um, women. So, like, or sorry, among the women who died from drugs or suicide, we looked at their hospital utilization between the delivery of their baby and the woman's death. Um, and I'm just kind of simplifying things here. We did more than this, but like, Gen in general, what we found is that um, about two, uh, three quarters of the women who did die from, you know, drugs or suicide made at least one hospital or emergency department visit between their delivery and their death. And like one of the things we found is also that like most of those visits occurred in the, like the second half of the year. So I don't know if you are or know a woman who has given birth recently, but like the kind of standard of care is that, you know, you, the woman gets a six week checkup, right? So she gives birth, she's got a six week checkup after the birth of the baby. And it's at that six week checkup that the, the, the clinician is supposed to be asking her like, how are things going? You know, are you feeling depressed? Are you struggling with anything, et cetera? After that six week checkup, there's no kind of mandated or recommended point of care for the woman. The baby has to have checkups, but the woman does not need to. And what we found is that like the majority of these, you know, drug and suicide deaths are occurring long after that six week checkup, right? Like in the time when the woman is not really even, you know, not getting care for herself a lot of the time. And sort of particularly relevantly, in our not well-run healthcare system, it's not really a system at all, many women by like a month, maybe six months after their um, the birth of their baby, um, if they were on Medicaid, which so all pregnant women can are el basically eligible for Medicaid, at least in California, but then right now, like they lose that Medicaid coverage if they don't otherwise qualify for it because for income reasons. So actually lots of women are losing their insurance status and there's kind of churn in their insurance, um, you know, after their baby is born. And that of course, like can be incredibly disruptive for if they're like, you know, undergoing care for mental health problems or substance abuse. So it, it's really sort of this like very problematic period of time um, for women and it shows up um, in their in their death rates. So um, just to summarize this, so drug related deaths, again, there was a second leading cause of mortality among postpartum women. Uh, if you combine the drug deaths and the suicide, those deaths combined account for about one in five of all postpartum deaths in our state. Um, right, so non-Hispanic um, white women were at highest risk and those with Medicaid insurance. Um, and, you know, the, the vast majority of these suicide deaths are occurring between in the last six months, right, six to 12 months postpartum. Um, and most of those women um, are, are going to the emergency room or to the hospital, you know, between the time they're delivering death, which is one point of, I mean, it's not like it's good, but at least we could potentially like catch them there and like intervene hopefully in the future. So just a couple of implications of this. So, you know, this work contributes in part to um, other evidence um, suggesting that emergency departments can be a pretty cheap, a potentially really useful setting for identifying people who are at high risk for suicide and drug overdose. Um, but in order to do that, we really need to be doing like ongoing surveillance, right? This is like a one-time study. There is no ongoing surveillance of sort of patterns and correlates of suicide mortality and other mortality among emergency department patients. So we really need to be doing a better job of that. Um, and from a public health perspective, I think what these findings really show is that we need to be doing a lot more to provide, um, you know, emergency department based suicide and drug overdose prevention measures. There actually are some really good ones out there. They're just not in widespread use. 
Um, so, you know, a, part of that is that we should be screening emergency department patients for suicidality um, and developing new interventions um, that are particularly targeting like not just these patients' suicide risk, but they're like broad spectrum mortality risk, right? Like things from natural causes as well. For the postpartum moms, I, I think it's like really obvious that we need to be paying attention much more to their risk of drug and suicide and homicide mortality. There's just like not that much attention um, paid to that, um, to these causes of death. Um, but part of this really needs to be better screening of women who are, you know, might be vulnerable and getting them into treatment, but we also really need to reduce the stigma and like legal punitive consequences, um, especially for moms who are having serious mental health problems or who disclose drug use, like many of whom would be afraid to even say anything about it in the fear that their baby could be taken away. And maybe if they have other children that their other children could be taken away. So, um, few policy implications. This is more about like, like we need to do more big data linkage. I love, I love data. I'm a big supporter of linkage. So like, I think the state needs to be doing more to facilitate this. Um, I really think that we need to be including suicide and overdose deaths as like a, a benchmark for healthcare quality. There are like talks about doing that, but it's kind of not a universal thing. Um, and we certainly need um, like more legislation to increase healthcare access, particularly for postpartum women, um, but just in general, like we need better access to mental and behavioral health care. So I will leave it at that. So I, so I have, pretty, I put this as pretty much the end of all of my talks that, you know, if, if we treated physical diseases or if physical diseases were treated like mental illness, like it would, we would be so much worse off. Like people think about mental illness as being this different thing, but it is an illness just like you know, just like any other injury or the flu, et cetera. Um, so mental health is health. And I think that gets lost sometimes in national discussions about this. Anyway, I will end there. Happy to take questions. Thank you so much. And if anybody does have questions, if you want to put them into the chat, I have it open. Or if you want to unmute yourself and ask the question, that's fine too. We have some more people. Hello. Hi, Monique. Hi, Beth. Hi, Kim. Hi. Hi, Sidra. Thank you oh. for this. It was really great to hear about your research. Um, I joined a little late, but I was curious. Um, you know, I came in and you were talking about the increase in mortality for people that have, like, had the emergency room presentations or emergency department presentations, but like they had sort of non-suicide related deaths, either like natural causes or accidents. What do you think the reasoning is for like those increases? Yeah, that's a really great question. So there's probably a lot of different reasons. Um, and I just sort of contextualize this with like, it's not just people who are suicidal. Um, people with mental health problems basically of any kind have um, been shown to have much higher rates of death. Like the, I think there's some studies showing that on average, people with mental health problems live for 10 years less compared to people without mental health problems. Like it's an astounding disparity. So I don't want to like suggest that like this is sort of just restricted to people who are, you know, who are suicidal. Um, and like, and a lot of those, a lot of that dis the disparity, the discrepancy in, in their causes of death is due to natural causes, right? Not to, not to injuries. So, um, I mean, people with mental health problems on average have lots of other problems in their life as well, right? Like there's often sort of a long history of, of trauma, of family issues, um, of poverty a lot of the time, and all of those things contribute to shorter lifespans um, and increased risk of disease. Um, there are also um, kind of uh, risky behaviors that people with, um, with mental health problems are more likely to engage in. So like these days, especially um, people with mental health problems are like way more likely to smoke 
than people without mental health problems. Like there, there's sort of this like increasingly concentrated association between mental illness and smoking behavior. And obviously we know that like smoking behavior rate is like contributes to, um, to increased risk of death. And there's other, you know, there's sort of other risky behaviors that um, the people with mental health problems engage in at higher rates that, that contribute to this. Um, so, you know, um, there's also things like, you know, people with mental health problems are much more likely to be victims of violence than they are to, to perpet, you know, to perpetrate violence. And so like they have really high rates of homicide because they're victimized, um, you know, what, because they're homeless, or when they're homeless, even when they're not homeless, et cetera. Um, so like it's complex, lots of different reasons, but there can be many things that contribute to, um, you know, to chronic disease onset, to cancer onset, to accidents, um, to homicide for, yeah, for lots of reasons. Donald, did you? Yeah, hi, thank you for this talk. It was really great. Let me lower my hand. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, just thinking about the problem of, of keep getting these numbers, you know, that there's probably a lot of times it's a really fine line between something that's suicide and something that's an accident because gauging in risky behavior can be a way of kind of committing suicide without really doing it. You know, I, someone I know uh, who's close to me died of a drug overdose and it was ruled as a drug overdose. And in my head, I go, was it really an overdose or did this yep. person really need to take their life? I, I can't answer that. I don't know. Um, but it is, it, it's, it's a very, you know, obviously if you, if you could know exactly the intent of everybody who has an accident, those these figures of suicide might be a lot higher. Yeah, it's a great point. Like it's not something that I sort of start out by talking about, but it's like it's such an important issue in this whole field is like the sort of the quality of the data is is just not where we want it to be, but it's probably unlikely to ever be perfect for exactly the reasons that you mentioned, right? That like, it is hard to figure out what somebody's intent was a lot of the time, especially in drug overdoses where it's like this known, it's a huge issue, but you know, sometimes for other causes of death also like single, you know, if somebody crashes their car into a tree, well, like, you know, were they trying to do that or was it was it just an accident? It's just really hard to know a lot of the time. You know, I, I just one more thing. Are, are you familiar with the the conversation, the publication called the conversation? Yeah. Uh huh. This would this would be a great article, you know, to write a popular article. I think they would publish this in a minute. And you know, those articles get picked because they're um, creative content license. They get picked up by other sites like NPR and Newsweek and stuff. So, I think this would be a really Exactly. It sounds exactly like the kind of article they would publish. So yeah, I've thought about pitching something to them before and like just not had time. But you're, you're. I agree with you. So yes, I will. Maybe that is something I will work on over the summer. Hi, Sedra. Thanks so much for your presentation. I had sort of a question related to your comment that there's tends to be like follow up with people who maybe have cancer or some of these other um, diseases or conditions and that's not happening with mental health. Do you, do you see that as changing at all from what you're hearing or your research or I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and it's a great question. Like I would love to do something, you know, with that. So the reason that we have really good um, follow-up for cancer patients is because we have cancer registries. Um, so I don't, I don't know if any of you are like familiar with registry data, but, but um, it's like a, it's a mandated thing actually that I, I believe every state does. And like states kind of, they sort of merge their data. So like California contributes to one cancer registry and like that other states also contribute to. And there are these they're basically just like giant databases that, um, you know, every time a cancer patient or every time a person is diagnosed with cancer, it is mandated for that, you know, treating clinician to like enter them into the registry. And so then like a record is established for that 
you know, patient who has now sadly been diagnosed with cancer. And then like, it's kind of a centralized registry. And so even if they go and get um, you know, treated somewhere else or by a different doctor, those doctors also have access to the cancer registry. And so they just like, you know, they contribute data. So the person, you know, undergoes a regimen of chemotherapy, that information gets entered and like the dates of it and so on. And so it's just this like giant system that has been around for, I don't even know, but like decades at this point. And so and now like cancer registry data are publicly available and like all cancer epidemiologists use those data. So it's, yeah, it's like this giant system that has enabled us to learn so much about cancer. And I am not aware of any movement to do a similar thing with, with mental health patients. Um, it would be an enormous undertaking, you know, as it was like when I first started setting up the cancer registries. Um, I think the government should be paying attention to it, um, but I have not heard of anything. Um, so I have a colleague of mine that who's a co-author on, on, on the first two papers is a, a research scientist who's at the National Institute of Health. And like, this is kind of his big thing. Like he really is adamant that we be doing more to track outcomes among mental health patients. So he is doing like as much as he can at kind of the federal government level to, you know, to support that. But, you know, like he's kind of a lonely voice, unfortunately. It does sound like a big lift and I could see where maybe even additional concerns about like stigma and stuff could also come into play in this conversation and complicate it even more. Yeah, and like, you know, the people with mental health problems probably in comparison to, to cancer patients, for all of the, you know, the kind of social reasons that I mentioned, like they, they're more often homeless, they're more often poor, they're more often a, a mobile population. Like, obviously this is not true for everybody, right? Like we all know, you know, very functional um, people with mental health problems, but serious mental illness tends to go along with, you know, lots of social problems. And that can make it hard to track people over time also. So I think it would be like a more a difficult, you know, population of people to track, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be trying, you know, so. Oh, Nancy, um, yes, the, um, the talk is re was recorded. Um, so um, you, you will be able to view it later. Oh, and yeah, so use um, another reason for the lack of follow-up, maybe protection of confidentiality. Yeah, so that is also a really important, um, a really important consideration. I mean, patient confidentiality in general is, you know, a very important consideration, um, but, you know, Sarah, as you said, like for reasons of broad societal stigma, it's even more important for mental and behavioral health patients. I actually had a question, um, and I know it may be too early to know about this, but I'm really curious about, um, do you have any idea or projections about how the pandemic might be affecting this, or is there any kind of early, um, early research into that? Yes, so yeah, everybody has been wondering that, right? Like from very, actually the very early days of the pandemic when it became clear that like isolation and, you know, sheltering in place and so on was, was gonna have mental health, you know, impacts. Um, so it, it, there is emerging research. So there's like anecdotal evidence from certain hospitals or cities that rates of emergency department visits um, for self-harm have gone up, but it's not very high quality data. It usually takes a while for like the good quality data to sort of come out. So we're gonna be seeing a lot more of this, um, but actually the CDC just released preliminary data looking at the actual suicide death rate in 2020, and it went down by a lot, actually. Like it was, there were, I think 5,000, more than 5,000 fewer suicide deaths in 2020 than there were in 2019. Which like, you know, you guys have now seen, right? Like the, the graph was going up and up and up and up and up. And then it went down a little bit in 2020. And that was not what anybody was expecting. Um, 
we will see what happens in 2021. I don't have a great explanation for that, um, but like definitely there's gonna be um, lots of research looking into that. Um, other research has shown like unquestionably that mental health problems increased a lot um, and particularly in certain groups. Uh, it was particularly in young groups, particularly in Hispanic um, populations, you know, and um, yeah. So they, that also, it like kind of depends on where the research is coming from. Like I saw another presentation yesterday actually was showing that in the South, um, like you would expect that folks who are kind of most impacted by the pandemic would have the, the most mental health impact also, you know, frontline workers and, um, you know, people who already started out sort of socially vulnerable in terms of their income and so on. Um, and at least in the, in Southern states, um, this was kind of focusing on racial differences and that um, even though um, black residents in the South were much more impacted in sort of by the pandemic and sort of all the kind of regular you know, pandemic ways, their mental health was actually not as badly impacted as we see among white residents. So that's interesting. I know, so there's, you know, there's gonna be some inconsistencies, but like definitely mental health has been impacted, um, but suicide death rates went down in 2020. But again, like, you know, we'll see what happens this year. Yeah. Well, thanks for taking time out of your day, everybody. Really appreciate you coming. Thank yeah. you so much. And of course. I think we're about at time, unfortunately, but thank you so much for the presentation. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Hopefully I'll see everyone around town or on campus in the fall. <laughs>